I did a Google search um, because I'm incapable of original thought and uh, looked up uh, boilerplate clauses and the uh, kind of on the main screen the, the definition came up uh, which was uh, standard clauses used to fill in the blanks in the common law. Uh, no, they are not. The GCC is not part of the common law world. I, I'm, for, for those of you who are not British, um, you may not have got my accent, I am Scottish, not English. I really, really object to the fact that English lawyers take contracts to Scotland and assume that English law and Scottish law are the same because England is the best country in the whole world and everybody must do what England does and an English contract is going to be great. They change the spelling of a few words, they call it putting a kilt on the contract and assume it's Scottish. People do the same here, they call it putting a dish dash on the contract. It doesn't work. The law is different. And where it is particularly important and particularly relevant is boilerplate clauses, because boilerplate clauses are typically the bits where people are most lazy. They simply photocopy what they have in the office form, nobody reads it, nobody focuses on it, it just gets stuck in, and very often it simply doesn't work. I'm not going to run through the entirety of boilerplate clauses. We could be here forever and it would get, it would get extraordinarily tedious. Um, but I want to give you some examples of the kind of thing you need to think about. Uh, I'm going to cover, I think, four different sorts of clauses. I'm going to begin with entire agreement of clauses. Uh, you know the kind of thing. Uh, this contract sets out the entire agreement between the parties. There's been no reliance on any representation made, any representations that were made are not representations in the first place, and all the other remedies are excluded. A fairly standard sort of clause that you find. Those clauses, fine as they are, but what do they do here? Well, I've got a couple of relevant provisions from the UAE Civil Code uh, on the slide, uh, Article 185. Um, misrepresentation is when one of the two contracting parties deceives the other by, and then the key bit, by fraudulent means or by word or act. Misrepresentation in the Middle East is not negligent or innocent misrepresentation. Misrepresentation here is fraudulent misrepresentation. Other misrepresentation isn't particularly interesting as a matter of law. What does your standard boilerplate clause say in relation to exclusion of misrepresentations? It excludes all misrepresentations, bracket, except for fraudulent ones, close bracket. It's a waste of ink. It doesn't exclude anything because the only thing that it excludes is the thing that you don't have here. Article 186. Deliberate silence concerning a fact or set of circumstances shall be deemed to be a misrepresentation. Well, that's something that the standard clause doesn't pick up. So it, the standard mystery, uh, entire agreement clause will try to tackle stuff that the law here has tackled for you already and you didn't need to say anything. It won't typically tackle the thing that the law here does give you that if you were drafting a UAE provision, you would deal with. So. There's a very narrow definition uh, left uh, in the UAE. There is also, though, the fact that here, unlike England, like, like most of the world, but unlike England, where the boilerplate clauses come from, there's an overarching duty of good faith. Again, the standard boilerplate wording on entire agreement clauses will not exclude the obligation of good faith under the UAE law. And if in your negotiations you have said to someone, yes, it's a Ferrari, and it turns out it's a Fiat, um, that is probably a breach of the obligation of good faith. So these clauses, typically the way they're drafted, are pretty much worthless for use in the GCC. Um, the second example I was going to give of something to, to uh, be conscious of here are exclusion and limitation clauses. Now, uh, it looks like nobody has actually received a copy of the slides, and I apologise, the type there is so small it is probably pretty much illegible. Um, that's a copy of clause 17.6 from the FIDIC forms. It's pretty much the same in all the FIDIC forms. I think I took that from the Silver Book. Um, the FIDIC forms are, by a very, very long way, 
the most commonly used forms for the world of infrastructure in the Middle East. The opening paragraph in 1706 is an exclusion for certain sorts of loss. Uh, neither party shall be liable to the other party for loss of use, loss of profit, etc. The second paragraph is a limitation. Uh, total liability under connection with the contract, except for some things, shall not exceed a given figure. So you've got uh, an exclusion of some things, a limitation for other, and then uh, an exception. Um, the subclause shall not limit liability for fraud, deliberate, deliberate default, etc. Very, very common. This contract is used hugely here, and words like that you see in pretty much every, um, every agreement in this part of the world. Um, first point is, is key. Um, unlike many other jurisdictions, here you can't exclude um, liability for tortious claims. Um, I've given you the reference number, it's 296 in the Civil Code. Any agreement purporting to provide exemption from liability for a harmful act shall be void. It is generally understood, I believe, and I, I'm, I'm open to correction for, from anyone who is um, qualified locally, but 296 is generally taken uh, in providing exemption to also mean you cannot limit liability for tort. So the limitation and liability you have, yes, it may bite if the, free, if the claim is advanced as a contract claim, but of course some contract claims can also sound as, uh, as tortious claims. Um, Bianca spoke about the uh, liquidated damages figures. And of course, liquidated damages are a, a common way of um, capping the, the liability. Um, and generally, in somewhere like England, and I now understand India, um, it works quite effectively. Doesn't work quite the same way here. Um, Article 390 of the Civil Code. Um, the contracting parties may fix and advance an amount of compensation. Fine, so you can have liquidated damages, but then too, the judge may, in all cases, upon the request of either of the parties, vary such agreement so as to make the compensation equal to the loss. So that means that the judge has the power to increase or decrease the amount of the liquidated damages to effect, to reflect the actual loss which the parties have faced. Now that's a pretty radical proposition from a, a common law perspective. I don't want to give the impression that that happens every time. The courts here actually do generally respect liquidated damages clauses, but it has nothing like the automatic force it has other places. Then the key words, the ones I didn't read out, any agreement to the contrary shall be void. So this is a provision that you cannot contract out of. And it's one of the most common reasons, in my view, why lots of contracts here are written other, under other laws than UAE law, is because people want to have a liquidated damages clause and know that the number there is the number and it will not be anything higher in the uh, context of the person actually providing the, uh, the services. Sticking with um, limitations on liability, I mentioned decennial liability uh, when I was up earlier on. Um, I've actually got here the text of Article 880, but it, it says what I said earlier. Um, if the building falls down, then the architect, the engineer, the contractor can be sued for 10 years. What I didn't deal with was 882. Any agreement tending to exclude or limit the decennial liability of the engineer and the contractor shall be void. You can't contract out of 880. You can contract out of uh, 390, I said, by choosing a different governing law. So it says you can't, you can't contract out of it, but yes, you can, you just choose English law. That doesn't get you anywhere in relation to 880, because 880 bites on buildings here not contracts governed by the law of the UAE, the law of Qatar, the law of Oman, but structures that are in the UAE, Qatar, Oman. So that liability, if you're advising clients from overseas, your clients just need to accept they cannot contract out of, and you can't get around it by just sticking in a, a foreign law. Um, other things that your exclusions and your exceptions aren't gonna bite on, um, 
personal injury and harm, and including including death, uh, criminal liability. That's that's pretty standard. Um, where an exclusion is contrary to uh, public order, and then the key exception, the bottom, uh, where there is evidence of willful breach or gross negligence, not fraud, but willful default and gross negligence. So. Um, an exclusion of liability here, yes, it works, but its scope is going to be quite radically different to what you might expect. Inapplicable provisions. I've only got the one slide on this, but this is something that actually makes me quite angry. Um, it is so common here to see provisions being excluded which couldn't have applied in the first place. Um, Ignore it. I'm not asking about the GCC. How many people here work, are based outside the UK? Most folk. Good. And how many of you see contracts that include things like an exclusion of the um, third party's rights under contracts Act 1999? Yeah, people keep sticking it in because English law is the best law in the world. Um, you see that here time and time again. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it is positively confusing. Um, it is quite common here to see uh, an exclusion of provisions where there is something quite like it locally, and the question becomes, um, did the parties mean to exclude the local thing that's like the English thing that you've mentioned? That you can live with, it's not helpful, but you can live with it. But the one that is really, really stupid, and you see time and again on corporate documents, is where things are defined by reference to bits of legislation that have no relevance here. An affiliate is an affiliate for the purposes of the Companies Act. Yeah, what does that mean? Because there are types of companies that exist in the Middle East that aren't known to English law. So for goodness sake, if you're going through a document and you're cross-referring to legislation, cross-refer to the right legislation. And, and I say, it, it's, just, it's just lazy and there's no excuse for it. And frankly, if you've got that in a contract that you know, some other firm has been involved in preparing, a negligence action is perfectly possible. Ah, right, got that off my chest. I feel better now. Um, the final topic I want to uh, chat through is termination clauses. And this uh, featured in brief on the slides I, I had before, but I said I would um, come back to it. Um, the UAE has a civil code which has different sections which deal with different types of contract. Um, the section I have quoted, um, 892, deals with lots of types of contract, basically any contract whereby you um, are going to do something for someone else. So it includes pretty much all services contracts and construction contracts and so forth. Almost all of these contracts include a termination clause and almost all of them are English in origin. I should say, I, my wife is English. I don't have a thing against the English. It's just English law. Um, the clauses are English in origin, and they say, when certain things happen, I can terminate. So if, for example, you are in breach and I give you a notice saying you must cure that breach within 15 days and you fail to cure the breach, I can terminate. If you are, have a receiver appointed, I can terminate. Perfectly standard wording. UAE law says no, Qatar law says no, Omani law says no. What they say is a contract terminates in two ways. Completion, oh, sorry, three, completion of the works. You can just finish what you were doing, it, it, it just comes to an end. Or it terminates because the parties have agreed or by an order of the court. The parties' agreement does not mean there is a clause in the contract which says I can terminate if you are in breach. It means I say you're in breach, I give you notice, and you say, yeah, you're right, actually, I am in breach, sorry, you can terminate. Uh, I've been doing this job now for 20 odd, I qualified in 91. Um, 
I, I have never, ever, ever seen a situation where somebody has given notice of breach and the other side has come back and said, yes, you're right, I can, I can terminate. That just doesn't happen, which means that termination clauses here don't work. You have to go to the court. It would be so easy to fix because you can effectively contract out of 892. Now, you can't opt out of it. But what you can do is you can provide in your termination clause that you are able to terminate automatically without order of the court, which then brings you in within the consent of the parties. Standard form wording doesn't do that, because standard form wording is not drafted with the UAE, with the GCC in mind. It would be a dead simple fix. Termination clauses are important. They're almost always standard. They almost always don't work. Uh, what happens if, you, if your termination clause doesn't work and you give notice of termination? Well, your contract probably isn't actually terminated. You have to go to the court, which could include arbitration if you have a, an, an arbitration clause. Uh, but in the meantime, you can be required to carry on uh, performing. Uh, specific performance might be ordered by the uh, court or the arbitrators rather than the termination that you desire. Uh, the counterparty may be given a cure period. And most importantly, this, this last one, the breaching party may remedy any breach at any time until the court has actually given the order to say, you know what, yes, Craig, you are entitled to terminate. The party in breach can fix the breach and then the contract carries on. It makes your termination clause pretty much worthless. It's a dead straightforward thing to get right. Nine times out of ten, people don't do it, and the reason they don't do it is sheer laziness. That was all I wanted to say, but I feel I have ranted and shouted at you. I don't know whether you feel that it's been worthwhile, but I've enjoyed it. I'll pass back. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Craig. Thank you.